Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our chapel speaker uh, for today. My love of my life, Alice, my wife. We met a little over 40 years ago, her first week as a freshman at Ohio Wesleyan University, my first week at, as a sophomore, and a year and a half later, uh, we were married. So I've known her a long time, very intimately and well, and, uh, and I would say that she is a woman of incredible wisdom, of deep biblical knowledge, and passionate prayer. And, uh, when, when, and certainly she's been the biggest spiritual influence on my life. And when Ben heard her give her testimony at our church last Easter, he thought rightly that it would be so appropriate for you to hear what she has to say about her life. So help me welcome Alice up to the stage. I would not have met Tremper or even be standing here at Westmont College if it had not been for God intervening and changing me. Here is that story. It is the defining story of my life and ultimately for our marriage. I don't think I ever would have married as a sophomore in college unless it was the hand of God. Oops, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, honey. <laughs> I'm sure some of you were shaking in your boots when you heard him say that. <laughs> my early life was not exactly a happy one. On the surface, my life seemed to be very comfortable. As a family, we had a lot. We had money. We lived in a nice house located in a suburb of Philadelphia. My parents were attractive people. They had lots of friends. We seemed to have everything but there were very deep problems. My parents fought all the time. Alcoholism and adultery especially made matters worse. Then one morning after my father went to work and without his knowing, my mother packed us up, got on a train, and moved to South Florida. That was 1958, when it was a daring, unusual move made by a woman. My mother wanted a divorce and was set on it. And divorce was also very rare compared to today. I was six years old. My brother was three. All this came as a great shock. The sudden transition was truly difficult. It was the beginning of a period of deep sadness for my brother and me. And life was very difficult for my mother, now single, in a strange place, without friends and family. My brother and I were confused, and our loyalties were divided. The people we loved the most hated each other, and now live thousands of miles apart. A few years later, our parents remarried other people. My mother moved back to Philadelphia with us. We lived in blended families, and that was complicated. But the bitterness between our parents remained constant. Every year, my brother and I would have to go before a judge and lawyers in children's court until we were 18. Oops, is there a problem? <laughs> okay, scratching. <laughs> We had to go um, before judge, a judge and lawyers until we were 18 year, years old because they contested his custody rights. Even though our parents loved us, they vented their anger at every opportunity, even outside of court. It was laced in everyday conversation. But don't feel too sorry for me. I learned quickly how to manipulate it. And the the bitterness between them for my own selfish purposes. I got better gifts and usually more lenient punishments. As we grew older, my brother and I became more aware of the influence alcohol had on our family. Both sets of parents increasingly came to rely on alcohol and medication 
to help with stress primarily. My stepfather was a physician. He could get medicine anytime. But they also took alcohol and drank a lot be for social reasons. They had friends who really drank. I remember coming home from parties where we would be with them out to dinner, and I was fearing for my life that the car would crash. It was one of the most frightening experiences I've ever had driving with a drunk driver. What I learned from all this, well, in addition to just the scariness of alcohol uh, physically, there was, there were, my parents for, just forgot many conversations and their mood swings were really unpredictable. And there were very intense emotional moments where there was occasional abuse. What I learned from all this was to be suspicious, angry, and to protect myself and my brother at all costs. Then I started to drink in my early teens. I started really early because there was so much alcohol in the house and later took drugs for the same reasons as my parents did. Things were bad at home and that affected the way I related to my classmates at an all-girls prep school. I hoped I would find more happiness in friendships Maybe I had higher expectations than most kids. And I had friends, but even friendships could be unpredictable and precarious. At times, my friends were fun to be with, but that could change quickly for some unknown reason. We could be cruel to each other, and especially in those teenage years, that became pretty intense. Mostly, we took pleasure in excluding others and on being on the inside. I knew I was hurting others for the sake of looking good. I became skilled at sarcastic humor, a strategy to protect myself. You must be wondering how I felt about God. I probably believed God existed, but that he was really distant. When I was scared, I prayed to him, but that was just a cry in the dark and just momentary. As children, we attended church. Church was very formal and liturgical. It was a big Episcopal church. The teachings from the Bible and the prayers contributed to this oppressive feeling of not measuring up. I mean, God's rules were very impossible to live up to. God himself, God in my mind actually, was a very demanding and hard taskmaster. Jesus was confusing to me. I remember seeing a mostly sentimental movie called King of Kings back then and wondering, if Jesus was supposed to be God, why did he suffer in the most shameful and gruesome way? If he was God, why couldn't he prevent his own death? I asked a priest that question, and his answer was that he was an example that God cares for you and your suffering. Others said, look, this is what you learn from Jesus. You love God, you love other people, you pray to him when you're suffering, life will be better for you, and hopefully you'll go to heaven, which in my mind meant there really isn't a heaven. It's wishful thinking. Another problem I had with church was that people in church did not really practice what they believed. They had behaved no differently from the non-believers. Our priest, a father of a friend of mine, had an affair with his secretary in the belfry, as it turned out. I decided my Christ that Christianity was really an unsatisfying, deceptive religion, and I put it out of my mind. Didn't go back to church. Then there was an accident one Friday night. It was a terrible tragedy. Friends, Sally and Jeff, were on their way back from a party and died in a car crash instantly. They had just... They, they were new drivers, but they probably also had been drinking. It was very sudden, unexpected, and chilling. I had seen a few older people die painfully, like my grandfather, but he was older. And here was somebody my age who was just taken from us in a moment. And those kids were the only kids in the family, so the parents were really bereft. I remember thinking... Death was so final, so abrupt and painful. What really matters 
since death can be so random and inevitable. And I wondered, if there is a God, why did he let something like this happen? God not only seemed distant, demanding, powerless, but cruel. At this time, sophomore year, 1969, it's way back, we were reading a lot of literature in several classes at school. In a college prep school, it was a great school, we would often take a whole semester to study one book. And, and one of the books we studied was Hamlet by William Shakespeare. And we also read a lot in French class, too. These readings, and we had to memorize a lot of these, uh, these books, a lot of sections from the books. These readings raised a lot of questions about death and living in the face of death. Hamlet's famous speech, you know, the one that goes to be or not to be. His famous speech about death haunted me because there was something in that speech. The dread of something unknown that happens after death haunted me. And his comments about conscience kept bothering me. It seemed I could not escape thinking about suffering, guilt, and death. All I wanted to do was forget about them. Our English teacher was unusual. She was a Christian, and that came through quite clearly. It wasn't like she was trying to persuade us. Uh, it just came through when she taught. I found myself really wanting to believe in a God like the teacher, uh, but I identified more with writers who were more pessimistic about the human predicament. Life is hard, and then you die. I thought I would never bring children into a world like this. All I saw was struggle. And to make matters worse, adults were always saying, this is the best time of your life. <laughs> It'll get harder. And I'm going, oh, I, got, I got scared. I said, what will happen to me? What will the future hold? But I also had such deep longings for lasting beauty, certainty besides the certainty of death. Justice, fairness, goodness, and selfless love. There were brief moments when I experienced these. The moments never lasted long, however. And it was unbearable to contain the tension between the longing and the reality of life. One day, as we came into music class, I'll never forget it, uh, into English class, music was playing. And this particular piece, the teacher um, told us, was called Yezu Joy of Man's Desiring. This piece of music was so beautiful, so compelling, that it invoked that intense longing, and I could not ignore it. The tension grew really great in me that day in class. I knew I had to go talk to the teacher after class. So after everybody filed out and I wouldn't be seen, I went up and talked to her. And the words out of my mouth surprised me because I said to her, how can I know God the way you do and how can I love him? The teacher was totally baffled. And after a couple of minutes of just being startled, she said, do you realize you are a sinner? And I go, of course I am. What do I do about it? It was a no-brainer. <laughs> she said after a few she said a few things, but she said something that really stuck in my mind. She said, "Have you ever read the Bible?" And I said, "No, I tried to read the Bible, but it was just too oppressive and too difficult to read." And she said, "Well, why don't you try starting at toward the end of the Bible by reading the Gospel of John?" And that surprised me because she was an English teacher and it was at the end of the book. So I went home that day, searched for a Bible, an old King James, stuck in the library, pulled it out and started reading the Gospel of John. Before I actually read it, I prayed, God, if you are there, show me. I read about Jesus. I get kind of emotional about this because even after 40 years. <laughs> he was identified immediately as the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. 
He made bewildering comments like, you must be born again, not a physical birth, not by human effort, but by the Spirit of God. I had never heard that in my life. I was totally bewildered. Then there was the amazing statement, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that who, whoever believeth in him will not perish but have eternal life. Then there were, the, there were claims that addressed the longings I felt in my heart. The claims were, I am the living water. He who comes to me will have a perpetual spring of water welling up within them. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never grow hungry. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but walk in the light of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Then he said, those who listen to my voice will recognize me and come to me. These were the things that stood out to me and still do. It was astounding reading about him, the way he addressed people, healed them, showed his great power on many occasions. I was brought face to face with Jesus. I thought before I was sinful by not measuring up to my own conscience, but now in reading about, the faith, uh, reading about Jesus, I was beginning to see I was thoroughly sinful. In God's eyes, I was exposed to the heart. As for my question about his death, I read that he came to die. Before, him, before I thought him powerless. But on the contrary, by willingly putting aside his very great power, he laid down his life not because he had to, but only out of love for me, for the world, and the Father. This was not compassionate suffering. This is much greater. A deeper, sacrificial, life-giving suffering requiring unheard of love. And he did this to forgive me. God did not seem distant. God came to me. Before reading the gospel, I did not understand the resurrection. I thought it was merely wishful thinking that somebody thought he rose physically from the dead. Maybe a psychological, mystical experience. Nobody really talked about East, uh, the resurrection except on Easter. I read that by raising Jesus physically, God destroyed death's power in this life and created a whole new way of life with a new heart. It was a supernatural change, a vital Loving relationship with God was possible precisely because it was God's work. Belief was not something you stirred up or talked yourself into blindly. Belief was a gift from God. All I had to do was receive it and believe it, and it was so wonderful. For almost two years, I read the Bible off and on, went to Bible studies, went with my teacher to church and her husband to church, studied other religions just to make sure uh, they weren't all saying the same things, leading to the same place. I wasn't, it wasn't like I prayed a prayer and that was it. I did not want to give up the things I enjoyed but knew were wrong. I still took drugs. I was in serious relationships with non-Christians. I partied and ran away from home. I, did many, I hid many things from my parents. I felt totally miserable. I wanted to have it both ways. I wanted to live a certain lifestyle and believe in God. Another reason I hesitated to commit myself to God, or to the Lord, was because I was warned by other Christians who were older that it was a very serious matter to commit yourself to God himself. The cost would be great, very great. And they didn't want me making a decision without thinking things through. Many Christians 
say, pray the prayer and your life will be happy and everything will be wonderful. But Christians I was hearing from said life will be harder as well as abundant, involving much sacrifice and suffering, not to mention rejection. I knew deep down the love of Christ was far better than anything I had ever known. He died for me. I knew intellectually that his power would provide in difficult times, but it was practically hard for me to believe. And I remember a few instances, but one in particular where I was at a party and people were saying, do you really believe that the Bible is true? Do you really believe what's in there? And I denied it because I was afraid of what they think. I was afraid my reputation would be ruined. I would not be popular anymore. And then after I said that, I would feel so terrible in my heart. I felt God's sorrow in my conscience. I wanted God, but I only wanted him at the periphery of my life. And by not deciding wholeheartedly to be for him, I decided against him. But thankfully, God did not let me stay in this state for long. He is gracious and patient, and he presented opportunities for me to change this stance. And most of those opportunities came through other, well, well, with the help of other people who were Christians that were older, giving me advice. Um, Midway through my senior year, I was planning to go to a college in Vermont that was a well-known arts college, but it was also known as a pothead college. This was the early 70s. (laughs) A leader of a parachurch ministry I occasionally attended, uh, familiar with the college, Uh, warned me in a concerned but gentle way that I would be putting any faith I had in jeopardy if I went there. He knew of no Christian on the campus, and he knew of its reputation for attracting only one kind of student. I was aware of this. I was in denial. But now he was making me accountable for my choice. I could lose touch with other Christians. I could lose any faith that I had. I realized then and there I did not want to Uh, limit my options, and it scared me that I would lose something really precious. I applied again to other colleges west of the Allegheny Mountains this time, farmland as my friends called it, late before summer and was accepted in July. Of the three places I applied, I, I chose the place where I actually talked to a Christian for 10 minutes. I must admit my parents and my college counselor were totally baffled by this change and my reasoning. Another opportunity came when my Bible study leaders uh, made it possible for me to study and work at Labrie Fellowship in Switzerland, French-speaking Switzerland. They thought that living away from my parents in a Christian community would help me. My parents were increasingly becoming more hostile about my interest in Jesus I never thought my parents would agree to letting me go. It just sounded so great to go to Switzerland. The day I left would leave the day after I graduated from high school on my own and lived there for three months before college. I said, oh man, they'll never let me go. But amazingly enough, my parents knew the family of the founder, Francis Schaefer, and thought since he came from a good family, it was okay. It still is amazing to me that God used that family connection to give me the opportunity to live in Christian fellowship. I came to two important realizations at Libri. Uh, Once again, my Bible study leaders, who were always the wet blankets, actually, but very wise, said, watch out when you go live in Christian community. You may expect Christians to live a higher, uh, you know, more Christian-like. To a, you may hold them accountable to a higher standard of living, but be warned. They'll sin. They'll disappoint you. There'll be lots of problems. Just because they're Christians doesn't mean they're not sinners. And he was right. They were right. I was prepared, and I'm thankful that for that preparation. I also learned how to live love sacrificially because of that. That advice 
kept me from becoming quite cynical when I experienced disappointments that summer. The other life-changing realization occurred one morning when I woke up after being there a few weeks and looking out the window and seeing the beautiful Rhone River Valley with Mont Blanc in the back and the French Alps. I was just so impressed with God's presence, it was overwhelming in the beauty of his creation. I had been reading his word, and because I'd been reading and studying his word closely, I could feel the grip of the self-protection that I clung to for so long loosening. God's love expressed in the devotion and the repentance of believers around me convicted me. I knew the time had come for a conscious decision. I asked his forgiveness for my refusal to follow him wholeheartedly. I could give myself totally to the loving Lord, Jesus, once and for all, and I finally came to a point where I could trust and obey him no matter what happened. And I prayed a prayer of surrender with jo tears of joy, relief, and rest. And finally, the third opportunity God gave me, uh, this is where Tremper enters in, <laughs> um, I was like, not long after I returned from Switzerland, went straight to college. No one knew me at college except for a person I met at a party over spring break and the Christian I met for 10 minutes months before. I, I could shape whoever I wanted to be in college. It was a clean slate. Nobody knew me. In the first week, I was asked to go out with um, a group of potheads, and <laughs> I have a real problem. And the old way, uh, way of life really still did have appeal. And partly is, I thought those people were definitely more sophisticated or more worldly wise, less vulnerable than most, uh, not as naive. And then someone on my hall asked me to go to the Christian Fellowship meeting for the same time. The timing was actually a gift or I might not have thought twice about it. I had to make a decision, and that decision was surprisingly difficult, even after being in Christian community for months, and even after making that wholehearted commitment. The old life still had appeal. But I knew after thinking about it that it would fast lose its appeal from experience, remembering the misery of living for myself rather than God. And I remembered how glorious it was to live with a clear conscience and how glorious it was to enjoy God's love. Once again, with the wonderful Holy Spirit's prompting me and convicting me, I chose the fellowship meeting. And guess who is there? <laughs> Tremper Longman. <laughs> yeah. It took a while, though, for us to really uh, get to know each other. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> um, I, nothing, sorry, honey. <laughs> we were totally different people, believe me. Trevor was a football player. I was not. I kind of wondered about them. <laughs> Tremper was not a student. I was a student. <laughs> anyway, times changed. God changed. <laughs> All I could say it was the hand of God for both of us. <laughs> Unexpected gifts and great blessings were to follow from this decision. And many, many challenges were to come. That was 40 years ago, as my husband has already indicated. And through really difficult times and wonderful times, I have struggled and rejoiced with Lord Jesus and never regretted it. I do have an intimate, close, and loving relationship with him. He has transformed my life and still continues to do so. I have witnessed his great power on many occasions. And one of those occasions was the decision to come to Westmont, by the way. He has guided us always, even when we were unaware, both Tremper and I, and has never let us go. Thank you for letting me share this story with you. And you'll have to ask Tremper for the details, although he, I hear he spilled the beans about some things in his classes. Take his classes, you'll find out. I just want to pray a prayer of praise. Praise you, Lord Jesus, for saving my life. Thank you that you bring hope that you love us, you loved us first, that you will come again in great glory, 
that you have forgiven all our sins and you have made us new. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father Almighty, for sending your Son. Amen.